yesterday, Stephen Lukes paid the perfect gentleman <coughs> when he announced that he would read his paper so as not to put his discussant as an embarrassment. I am, of course, in the perfect scoundrel. Um, and so that means that to some extent I will deviate from this paper based upon some newfound information of deep importance. And it turned out as I came here to speak, I got a little copy of a book that Tom Palmer put out about uh, markets, and there was an essay by Professor Dawson there. And I discovered that, in fact, I am a longtime believer in Dharma, even though I only heard of the word uh, 20 minutes ago. Uh, the equivalent of that word within the English language, I suppose, would be ethos, custom, norms of one thing or another. And in fact, I think it's extremely important because what it does is to capture, I think, one of the essential features that you're trying to talk about when you're dealing with capitalism, um, which is it is, in fact, a very elaborate set of social norms, some expressed, some implied, and so forth, and that you therefore have to be extremely careful to identify the beast before it is that you start to denounce it. And in this particular case, what I'd like to do is to begin, at uh, begin in part by indicating something of the theses that I do not choose to defend, and I hope that nobody else would uh, choose to defend. Um, I am certainly interested in defending capitalism and markets. This is not, however, a talk which is designed to denounce family as a valuable source of social interaction, which depends very heavily on non-market principles. It is not a talk which is designed to denounce charity or other kinds of benevolent behavior of various kinds of individuals. It is not a talk which is designed to defend the views that capitalism only works when you have greedy people interested solely in material possessions. A system of voluntary exchange allows people to determine the ends that they wish to satisfy and how they wish to satisfy them. And there's some people who go hard into markets in order to bargain uh, to receive those things which in fact are spiritual goods, intellectual goods. It is certainly not in any way sense a, an attack on culture. It rather is, if anything, exactly the opposite, which says that only if you have a prosperous commercial economy can you actually develop the resources necessary to sustain a voluntary sector in cultural and community kinds of activities. And it is certainly in terms of behaviorals that you wish to observe in people, uh, most people who are involved very heavily in commerce also spend a great deal of their time working on various kinds of voluntary and social institutions, art museums, history museums, whatever it is that you're talking about, uh, because they are as well aware as the critics of capitalism of the importance of creating some general form of culture in which you would then embed some kind of a commercial economy. Uh, the same token, when you start moving to more economic areas, the system of capitalism is not a system which essentially believes that there's no such thing as a market failure. Um, it turns out that there are a large class of public goods that can only be provided for by some kind of centralized government action uh, so that a responsible system of capitalism tries to think very hard about how it is that you organize the financing structure maintenance of infrastructure and similar kinds of activities. There are other kinds of public goods that only governments can provide, like defense and courts and so forth. Uh, the form of capitalism that I defend does not insist that every road, every street, uh, turn out to be privately owned, charged by coals. Um, it is something which is perfectly prepared to admit a mixture of common and private property, and it derives that going way back to the Roman law, where the initial discussion of property is not a discussion of private property. It is, in fact, exactly the opposite. It is a discussion of those things which are by nature, as they like to say, communal forms of property. Uh, so with all those kinds of caveats as to what it is that I'm not trying to defend, uh, let me see if I can explain what it is I'm trying to defend and how I'm trying uh, to defend it. If one starts to look at the sort of economics of this situation, you can say, I think, with a great deal of confidence, regardless of the kinds of commodities or services that are involved, uh, that there should be a long-term, persistent, and dominant preference, presumptive to be sure, but powerful nonetheless, in favor of competitive institutions over monopoly institutions. In the simplest way of explaining this thing, what a monopolist does is he reduces output in order to raise prices, and you can then demonstrate that the net economic consequence of that particular movement is to enrich the monopolist and to reduce the wealth of the consumer uh, but the key point in this is that the gain on the monopoly side 
turns out always to be smaller than the loss on the consumer side. Uh, so that what happens when you move from one system to another is that there is going to be a social reduction in output. And therefore, the major function of a society is to prevent that thing from taking place, if at all possible. Uh, there are some powerful normative conclusions that follow from this simple kind of social welfare um, observation, and let me mention what some of them are. Uh, the first is that an antitrust law, uh, which concentrates on horizontal arrangements between rival sellers in a particular good, is generally speaking going to be a very effective device if it, what it can do is to prevent the cartelization of a given kind of industry where we can be confident uh, that the gains that the monopolist will obtain from this kind of procedure will be smaller than the social losses are in question. And the antitrust law, as developed by classical liberals, was in fact a very important element with respect to their system. It is not, strictly speaking, a libertarian device because the issues associated with cartel formation and management and protection are not concerned with the protection against force and fraud. It's a protection against certain kinds of market organization. And as I sort of said when I talked with John Tomasi yesterday, uh, that the situation of the classical liberal is somebody who adds the antitrust function to a list which would not be on the list of no-nos put together by the standard hardcore libertarian. By the same token, it turns out that the libertarian or the classical liberal both are at one in saying that you should never spend public resources uh, to create monopolies where competition can thrive. And this would apply to labor markets, minimum wage laws, mandatory unionization rules. It applies to real estate markets, various kinds of zoning restrictions that are entry barriers. It retires to capital markets, how people get in to do banking of one form or another. And so the key feature with respect to the libertarian system or the classical liberal system is that what we do is we set a very strong opposition to barriers to entry and to exit from particular kinds of industries. This applies domestically, and of course it also applies most emphatically with respect to international transactions because both the classical liberal and the libertarian become essentially strong free traders, and their view is the only time that you could keep things from coming into a country are uh, to basically prevent the entry into the country of those things which if were developed inside the country would be banned or otherwise punished. So chemicals that kill of one sort or another would be there. If you start looking at the World Trade Organization, one of the great achievements that it has made is that it basically seems to get the right line in the right place with respect to the kinds of permissible restrictions with respect to entry and how it is that it works. Uh, this provision, it turns out to be a huge reformist tradition. If one goes back to the 19th century, uh, it is interesting if you look at Carlyle, who was often praised as a man of higher virtue. He was also the guy who defended Jamaican slavery and who generally was a very powerful defender of the caste system. And it was the utilitarian reformers who essentially were the major move in favor of market liberalization, which brought so much prosperity to England until that kind of wound to a halt in the first part of the uh, 20th century. And so if you think about the way in which I'm talking of this, uh, what you can say at least as a first approximation is that this is a pretty overt consequentialist scheme. Um, if you're trying to figure out how it is that you defend property rights, how it is that you defend the institutions of contract, and so forth, what happens is you're saying that each particular move that is made within the system, whether it be by the coercive activity of government or the private activity of given individuals, ought to be a positive sum activity or to use a phrase which is congenial to many economists but not heard too much yesterday in this discussion, is that when you try to put together a set of rules for both compulsory and voluntary contract, what you're always trying to do is to figure out a way in which you could minimize the deviations between private and social costs. You don't want to have a situation where private individuals bear costs that are greater than social cost, because if you do that, you will de reduce the level of activities which is beneficial. You don't want to create the subsidies in the opposite direction, because then you'll get the overproduction of certain kinds of goods, which in fact will cost the economy in terms of the subsidies that are taken from productive activities that are left with elsewhere in the system. It has often been said that folks who come with my general alternative are in fact believers in 
some kind of a possessive individualism. This is a common element here, as in other cases like Red and Tooth and Claw and Survival of the Fittest, in which the critics always have much more vivid ways to describe situations than the defenders. My own view about this is it's a matter of a branch of social welfare theory, and if you understand what the criterion are with respect to social welfare theory, then you will realize that there is no particular class bias built into these particular rules. What you're trying to do simultaneously is not engage in trickle-down economics, but to engage in a system where all transactions turn out to be positive sum, uh, such that the parties to it will on balance gain, and when you take into account all the external effects on third persons, what will happen is that the gains will either remain constant or in many cases will become larger. This last point, somebody asked the other day about what we meant about harm, is extremely important because most of the discussion that you hear is about negative externalities, pollution, and so forth. But it is important to understand that one of the hidden but important virtues of a market is the creation of what we call positive externalities. That is, to give you the simple situation, if there is an ordinary exchange between A and B which leaves both parties better off than they were before it happens, each of them now has more resources at his or her disposal, which means that the opportunities for trade for third persons increase according to that. So that generally speaking, when you say you enforce voluntary exchanges, you don't have to worry about these third party effects because they will be systematically positive. The obvious exception to that is the cartelization situation that I referred to before, but there you can identify the large negative externality which has no positive externalities that start to offset it. Uh, so essentially when you're doing this kind of analysis, it's important to remember uh, that all social analysis requires a 360 view of the world. That is, you have to take into account the impact of every particular transaction on every person in the world. What the economic theory allows you to do is to simplify the equation, for example, in the case of an ordinary voluntary exchange, by identifying the positive externalities. That's nothing that you have to regulate. It just becomes an additional reason why it is that private enforcement of voluntary arrangements is a very worthwhile social benefit. Now, how does one get to this particular position in terms of formal criteria? There are many people, I think, who are sort of intuitist about all of this stuff. Uh, amongst those, I think, is Friedrich Hayek, who, when you read him, sort of kind of had the sort of, sort of gut reaction that if you just let everything run as it would run, spontaneously it would move to a higher level. That's true in some markets. It turns out to be quite false with respect to the other kinds of markets. Bank runs, as Hayek well knew, are kinds of voluntary transactions that oftentimes can be either moderated or overcome by various forms of coercive or collective action, uh, bank restrictions of one kind or another, uh, to deal with it. But we're talking here at the level of criteria first. And let me now first give what the two criteria are that have been developed in the literature, chiefly in the late 19th century, in the mid 20th century. And these are the Parisian criteria on the one hand, and then the two Englishmen, Calder and Hicks, coming up with a variation of it. Uh, the formal definition of a Pareto improvement is a situation which says that one person will be made better off by a change and no other person will be made worse off. And the basic argument from a moral point of view is that if that's the state of affairs that actually develops, who is in a position to say that this is an untoward or undesirable situation? The only way in which you could do that is to let envy into the system, at which point you can veto any kind of a social improvement. So the first Pareto improvement that we make in general is to have the following proposition. The world will be a better place if the only reason that people wish to object to things is envy or offense, if in fact what we do is we rule those particular sentiments out of bounds. Um, the whole point about this is that you're not favoring one person over another, but systematically what you can do is to realize that once envy is knocked out of the equation, this is what John, I think, was talking about yesterday, uh, what happens is that the scope of voluntary exchanges starts to increase. If you take it into account, then there are always veto gates of uncertain size, which means that nothing can be done because there will always be somebody who, in fact, will try to veto something on the grounds that they're offended. In economic terms, this is sometimes also translated as the saying you don't allow people to take into account pecuniary externalities. But that is a very bad expression because how many of you who are not economists know what it means? Probably none. 
Uh, what it says literally is it's monetary externalities. What it means in effect more precisely is there are certain kinds of losses associated with a given individual which are in fact perfectly correlated with social gains. Uh, and that's the case with respect to competitive losses where a disappointed competitor, not entering into a transaction, always will have a loss, but given the overall efficiency of a competitive system, either you ignore those losses or it turns out that you run to some kind of an elaborate form of administrative state. For those of you who follow sort of American and to some extent English intellectual history on this, if you start looking in the period of the Great Depression in the 1930s, uh, the dominant motif for government intervention in many cases was a systematic recognition, so-called, of ruinous competition, where the argument was that since certain people had been disappointed in the market, what happened is that they were entitled to have protection and redress by the government. And if ruinous competition is stage number one of the argument, cartelization and entry restriction turns out to be stage two of the argument in every one of the markets that I've ever examined whether you're talking about labor, whether you're talking about dairy products, whether you're talking about agriculture, whether you're talking about importation. Uh, if you're going to say that the other guy is selling at a lower price than you can do is in fact an actionable home, then the only thing you can do is to engage in a protectionist system. So you have to make per se rules on these things, uh, ruling them out of discourse, otherwise the system itself will collapse of its own weight. The same thing is true with respect to offense. There is in the United States the question of whether or not you can ban those people who burn the American flag or otherwise punish them on the grounds that patriots are offended. And the great difficulty, of course, with that is somebody will always be offended by something which is done by somebody else. And if offense counts as a blocking externality, uh, then it turns out that the system will not work. Uh, so to answer the question that was put in the audience the other day, what counts as harm? Uh, the key point here is not to do it definitionally and to assume that these harms do not exist. It is, in fact, to do it analytically, to recognize that these are real harms, that they do leave people worse off, but these harms themselves are correlated with social improvements, and it's the social improvement that we're after, and so we learn to tolerate the harm. In terms of political theory, it's also worth noting that I will not be able to explain the people who are aggrieved of their grievances are misguided, and so you will have constant political pressure to expand the notion of harm in order to make sure that the state can intervene in various kinds of protectionist ways. And one of the great weaknesses of John Mill when he wrote his famous harm principle in On Liberty is by the time he gets to the end of the book, he has a definition of harm which is so broad that it turns out he's become basically the architect of various forms of modern socialism. It's extremely important to understand that the correct version of this subject comes right out of the Roman law. Uh, I don't know how many of you have studied Roman law. I urge you all to do it. It, in fact, is an incredibly sophisticated system. And their notion for pecuniary externality was damnum absque in uria, which in English means it is a harm without a legal injury, in uria being the Latin for against the law. And the whole point here, again, is that to keep a system coherent, there have to be a class of non-actionable externalities, where actionable means the kinds of things that you can go to court to sue to protect against, or the kinds of things that you go to an administrative agency to guard against. So you're trying, in a sense, to create Pareto improvements. And the alternative formulation, in many cases, is the so-called Calder Hicks formulation, and what this proposition says is you don't have to have the actual compensation transferred from one party to another, but essentially a situation is a call to Hicks improvement if the fellow who in fact engages in this activity can do so and in principle supply compensation to an aggrieved party which by that own person's subjective life will leave him at least as well off as otherwise. And the theory is using subjective um, versions of economic well-being a Pareto improvement may not be attainable, but you can nonetheless be confident that a call to Hicks improvement is positive sum. Now, many people say that this is a very liberal criterion that allows all things to take place, but the key feature to talk about here is the commonality between the two systems and not their differences. And the key point in this regard is that neither of these two systems will, in fact, tolerate anything which is a negative sum game. So if you try to play the game out with respect to monopoly, if somebody in fact is a monopolist 
and hypothetically tries to generate out of his revenues wealth to cover all the competitive losses, he cannot do it because there's an overall social loss that's been involved. So the key thing to understand is that when you're trying to figure out those kinds of activities which you want to prohibit, the point is that both of these tests have exactly the same kind of insistence and defense upon competitive institutions relative to their monopolistic rivals. Now, it is often said about the Pareto system uh, that it is much too exacting to deal with in a wide variety of situations. In fact, the more telling criticism of Pareto is the opposite, that in fact the system is in many cases too lax to deal with the problems of social abuse. So to explain why, what you have to do is to remember that with both Cato, with both Pareto systems and with Calder-Hicks systems, what happens is that you rule out all negative sum games. But the question is, you now have a second problem when you have a project which goes forward, which is positive sum for all its participants. And then the question is how it is that you allocate the gain amongst those participants. And it turns out that the Pareto formula, in fact, is not strict enough because it's perfectly consistent if you go, say, from a situation where you have two people with 10 to a situation where there's now 30, that one person get 10 and the other person get 20, or you reverse the situation. So you will now get political competition over the rents. All of you in your daily life know that you constantly talk about, oh, we got some common expenses, let's just split it. And what we mean by that is it's a prorater rule. And essentially what the prorater rule does, if you can enforce it, and in many contexts you can, is that it keeps you along the diagonal so that the improvements, instead of being either 20, 10, or 10, 20, or 12, 18, or whatever the numbers is, they're always 15, 15. And if, in fact, you can do proration, <coughs> one of the great advantages of it is it gets rid of all the measurement problems that you have to do in figuring out what's to happen. So that if you start looking at American takings law, for example, or indeed that of any other country, what happens is when you have general legislation which does not have disproportionate impact, what you tend to say is likely to be positive sum. Why is that? Because why would anybody vote for a piece of regulation that's going to make him worse off? And if everybody turns out to be in the same position as everybody else, the only differences that people will have will be in valuation. There will be no factional struggles that will start to take place. So it turns out that this pro rata rule, which is widespread in the law, is designed to prevent what is called in the economic literature the dissipation of surplus that starts to take place when you have competition over rents with respect to positive sum projects. For those of you who are curious to get a long and exhaustive account of how this plays out both in theory and in American constitutional law, 20 years ago I wrote a book called Bargaining with the State, which goes into the endless variations of this particular theme with respect to public works of one kind or another, licenses, permits of all sorts and descriptions. Now, this is obviously a completely consequentialist account. And John Tomasi told me during the break yesterday, he said, Richard, you understand that there's this really hot debate going on in philosophy now about whether or not all systems of morality are in some way ultimately consequentialist. And my reaction to John is the same reaction that I have to all philosophers, is they're 30 years late to the party. Um, <laughs> that this is a problem, in fact, which I, for myself, I've worked on since the early 1980s of one kind or another. And slowly what happened is as I became more aware of how various kinds of transactions work, I became less libertarian in the deontological sense and more consequentialist in the operation. Now let me first explain to you sort of personally how this happens and then analytically why it is that the personal odyssey of one Richard Epstein replicates in perfect harmony the intellectual progress of the human race. Um, <laughs> with that modern statement, let me begin. When you begin studying law as an ordinary student, what you do is you begin, although you don't understand it as such, with what we call dyadic relationships. So you become very snazzy in expertise in figuring out how you understand the contract of sale, understand the contract of hire, contract of, per of partnership, bailment. You understand about torts, running down accidents, stranger cases, nuisance cases, and so forth. And in virtually all of these cases, if you're a naive libertarian who sort of believes in strong individual property rights, uh, 
acquired in a good Lockean sense, you will come out with a very good approximation of the right result in these kinds of situations. You'll be a believer in personal autonomy against government intervention, against aggression by neighbors. Uh, you will be a strong believer in freedom of contract in the way in which you form these situations. But social life is more complicated than that. And as you start to move from two people to end people, it becomes very clear that the simple libertarian model does not work as well when you start to deal with collective action problems associated with funding public roads on one sort, dealing with bankruptcy type situations. We have multiple creditors of single sorts of parties, uh, dealing with pollution from multiple sources that come home to multiple sorts of individuals. And so what you then have to do is to ask yourself how you alter your judgments with respect to two-party cases to take into account n-party cases. And the moment you start to do that, you come to realize that under certain circumstances, voluntary solutions will not work. And so you have to be able to develop coercive ones. Uh, the question then is what's the test that you use for the coercive situation you put into place? And the correct answer to that which can be applied either to all systems of taxation or all systems of confiscation, is that you would like the coercion to work such that when you value things in the eyes of the people who are subject to the coercion, they are, when viewed systematically, left better off with the coercion in place than they would have been without it. And this is a fancy way of saying that you use coercion to overcome prisoner dilemma games or collective action problems in ways that produce proportionate social improvements so that you manage to achieve through government results or government action the same things that you hope to achieve through voluntary transactions, i.e. a generalized social form of improvement. And once you start to do that, you can't be a hardline libertarian because you now have to work taxation into the system, you now have to work condemnation into the system, you now have to work the regulation of very complicated resources that don't lend themselves to the simple application of the first possession rule, the Lockean rule. So you have to deal with wildlife extinctions, a problem which in fact was very important in ancient times and remains so through to the modern day. You have to worry about funny property systems. One of the interesting things about Locke, which proved that he was in some sense a genius and in another sense a hack, uh, is that when he started to write about property, he had no idea of the different regimes between land and water. And in fact, they operate in completely different principles because one of them is a race commune. That is something which has to be an open access regime as a first approximation. And the other is something which has to move towards individual rights. So to just give you one of many, many variations on this, the Lockean rule that you acquire something by first possession is very accurate with respect to land. Uh, but if you try it with respect to water, somebody could dam up a river and the whole thing will now start to break down. So the basic rule of property is if something is a common resource, no individual is entitled to expropriate it. You then have to figure out how much you can take out of the river, for example. It turns out the Lockean rule of as much again and as good is completely inaccurate with respect to the way in which this works. Uh, the correct answer in practice and applied everywhere is that you prorate the amount that you can take for consumptive use out of a river according to the number of riparians that you have, which means that as later people start to come in, the amounts that the earlier people have are going to be pro rata reduced, so you never get any of the zip back problems that are associated with Zokian theory. It's just a classic illustration of a brilliant man not knowing anything about the water system that sits in front of his very nose to see how in practice these characters have managed to solve the problem in ways that don't require you to engage in pointless philosophical deliberation. And one of the things that you discover, therefore, when you work with property regimes is that the kind of naive natural law view, which fits pretty well with land and with most chattels, does not, in fact, cover the full range of situations. And what you have to do is to become more functionalist and more utilitarian and consequentialist in the way in which you work these sorts of things. Uh, so what I'm trying to say, in effect, is that one of the big differences between myself as a lawyer and virtually everybody else who's spoken this thing who is not a lawyer is that I basically have a microscope uh, and I turn up the resolution on particular institutions, see how they operate internal to its situation, and in a strange way what happens is it reaffirms the importance of property rights and voluntary transactions. But on the other hand, it shows you the huge degree of variation in the structure and organization of property rights, which means that the place for coerced transactions, which I've referred to earlier, 
becomes larger than might be the case if you're dealing with a simple libertarian type of situation. So the question then is, how does this then tie into various kinds of philosophical arrangements of one sort or another? And, and that's the problem that I started to talk about. Now, I've read Kant periodically from the time that I was an undergraduate and a philosophic major. And then I realized that I had the following very great difficulty. I never understood pretty much a word of what this guy said. But on the other hand, as a low IQ type, when I read the English guys, I understood them fairly well, meaning Hobbes, Locke, Hume, and so forth. And in fact, I understood them well enough so that as one of my great teachers, and I was very young, said, I could figure out where they were wrong. Like Locke was wrong with respect to the Lockean proviso. I mean, I didn't figure it out in 1963 when I read it for the first time, but later on you can understand what's going on. The problem is when you lead somebody like Big Manny, uh, the unintelligibility barrier is in fact extremely high. And trying to break through that and to get to the sense of what's going on is extremely difficult. Uh, now, my own attitude towards great philosophical texts is to treat them as follows with massive disrespect. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, it means that when I read these characters, I assume that they've got something in there which is right, which is why that they've managed to survive. But my job is to try to figure out not only what's good in what they've said, but what is obscure, irrelevant, and silly, and so forth. Uh, so if you start going back, you could spend your time reading Hobbes talking about the assurance problem in ordinary voluntary exchange and see works of genius. You go 20 pages later and you're starting to talk about some of his religious speculation and you're watching the theater of the absurd. If you go back and you start to read somebody like Aristotle on reproduction, not so smart relative to what he said about corrective justice, which turns out to be correct in so far as it goes, but doesn't go nearly far enough to understand the full distribution of the problem. Not his fault, right? I mean, you know, he's still a pretty smart guy. But the point about this is the difference between myself and standard philosophers is I do not care that these guys are wrong. Why I try to figure out what's right about them and then put it into a system. And if, in fact, what I describe as being, I think, the essence of a Kantian position that makes sense, and it turns out not to be something that Kant believes in, doesn't bother me in the slightest. So just to give you a little anecdote about how this goes, one of my research assistants is, in fact, a PhD in political theory, comes to law school. He's certainly mortal, but very smart. And he does me a favor. He says he's going to take this paper and hand it over to one of his political science graduate student friends, who is a Kant expert. Now, I hear those words, and I start to get a very tumbly stomach, because it strikes me as being the wrong kind of psychology. And sure enough, I got the following email back about three days later. I read the first three pages of Professor Epstein. He seems to talk about consequentialism, which is clearly not the Kantian position, so I did not bother to read any further. <laughs> but I regard this kid, whoever he or she may be, as an academic failure at age 23. Um, it cannot be right. It's one thing to say I disagree with him because he misunderstands the genius of Mr. Kant or whatever, but it is not sufficient to say, oh, he gives a reading of this which is a bit off color and in fact is against his own reading because that's in fact what I've done with respect to Locke if you start to think about it. He starts off, generally speaking, as a natural law type. My view, having spent a huge amount of time dealing with the natural law tradition through the legal text, is that its weaknesses are all better explained through consequentialism of one kind or another than they are by trying to refine your own moral intuitions. And I note, for example, um, Tom, in this book that you have, right, David Bowes starts talking about natural imprescriptible rights. And I say, that's the same problem that all these other Lockeans start to have. I don't know what that phrase means either. And so the question then is, is exactly what it is that you're trying to do and how it is that you're trying to work this stuff out. And so if you start looking at Kant, the way I do it is I always start with the abridged version. Never read the original is the first principle of serious philosophical discourse. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, Kant gives you multiple forms of the categorical imperative, and he says, act in such a way that you will your actions should be done by all mankind. And that has a certain kind of stirring sort of situation. And the question is, what on earth does he mean by it? Well, the first thing he means by it, in effect, 
is that he thinks when you're starting to evaluate human behavior, uh, the welfare of no individual ought to be ignored in trying to figure out what the social calculus is. And that, in turn, means that, to put it in more technical terms, when you're trying to figure out what the utility function is, which maps you from individual to social utilities, there's no individual who does not have a place in that particular function. So if it's going to be f of something, and you have your arguments, individual one, two, and three, they cannot all be Brahmins, they can't all be Jews, they can't all be anything. It's got to be everybody. There's some people who want to put animals in that equation. I'm going to defer my discussion of Mr. Peter Singer to some other time and just leave ourselves with respect to humans, because I think that that is a perfectly sensible way to sort of start the equation out. So now, in effect, everybody's in this particular type of situation. And the question is, what is it you can will for particular individuals to do which you're willing to make a general law? And I do quote some passages from Kant uh, which stress the notion of absolute necessity but sacrifice the notion of intellectual clarity. So let me see if I can try and put together in a couple of ways how it is that this system starts to break down. And the first thing I think that one starts to note. So you start with this stuff, and you try to figure out where you go. And you say the following. If people start to engage in monopolistic activities, and other people then start to do it, essentially what you do is you compound the social losses. So it does not satisfy the Kantian criterion of universality. On the other hand, if you start to engage in competitive activities, and everybody else starts to imitate, what happens is you increase the scope of a competitive market. We generally know that competitive markets are not indifferent to the number of players who are in them. Uh, the thicker the market on accurate, usually the more accurate the pricing, right, Mr. Lingle? Right? And so what happens is uh, that's something when you generalize, it's fine. When you start looking, although I didn't talk about it in the paper, uh, the holdout problem, if some guy can snip a river so that nobody can cross it, and you universalize that, you get the Rhine River, and it turns out you get no trade or commerce. So what you need is the Treaty of Westphalia, which simply takes down all the toll gates in the way in which the system operates. And so what you can do is you could universalize the removal of blockades. You cannot universalize the creation of blockades. I want to stress, by the way, that these are not small effects that you're talking about. For those people who've spent their time working on what the economists call the double marginalization problem, it's one of the few cases when you look at the graph, you say, oh my god, this really matters. And in fact, the effects of double marginalization when carried out three, four, five stages are much more dramatic and much more dangerous than, in fact, the change from competition to monopoly. <laughs> Uh, you see what happens to consumer surplus, it just simply disappears and goes into nothing. You can do this graphically very accurately uh, with very little formal education. It is a very sobering explanation. Uh, so when you start looking at these kinds of social questions, the Kantian situation is if you could universalize something so as to make it a social improvement, you satisfy every element with respect to what he wants. And if you then ask Kant whether or not he has even thought about it, what happens is he always thinks about individual actions in terms of the individual will, and he doesn't think about them, strangely enough, in terms of their long-term systematic social consequences. Ironically, the guy who's talking about universalization doesn't know how to do, to use the modern terms, general equilibrium analysis, which is what is required in these cases to get the thing right. Now, if, in fact, you start to do that, will you get upset at Manny? No, you don't get upset at the guy. Why is that? Because the first systematic exposition of the contract or of the monopoly competition problem is not in the strong and powerful intuitions of Adam Smith, but you have to go through the late 19th century English writers, and the, basically Alfred Marshall was the first guy who actually put it down in a simple enough form that everybody else can understand it. And the marginalist revolution that he introduced in the late 19th century is, in fact, one of the single most important changes and developments in legal and economic thought, because it lets you understand how it is that you compare various kinds of social improvements and, in addition, to figure out when you're at a given place and you don't have a general equilibrium model, how you evaluate whether you should move in this direction or move in that direction. It's extremely important kind of stuff. As far as I can see, Kant never thought about it. He didn't understand it. 
but his own theory is consistent with that. For those of you of a philosophical tradition, there's this very energetic, imaginative, and ultimately confused essay by a serious Englishman named R.M. Hare, in which he tries to explain why Kant is, in fact, a consequentialist. Of course, you don't read the essay through. I told you my first principles never do that. But what you do do is run a word search through it, and you put in Calder, Hicks, and Pareto to see whether or not his willingness to deal with utilitarianism translates into using the economic tests, which are individually based. And what happens, of course, is he doesn't use those terms, because even though he probably shared a college, with all these guys who are economists, he never talked to them in a way which would allow him to see that he was a, making an argument that was stronger than even he knew. And so what happens is what you have to do when you want to defend consequentialism is to avoid, as Kant rightly said, the dangers of aggregate utilitarianism, creating these imaginary entities that are supposed to prosper, and reduce it to what uh, most libertarians and classical liberals call a form of methodological individualism, find a way in which every large statement about an aggregate could be reduced to statements about individuals, and you could do that for societies in the same way that you could do it for partnerships and corporations and all sorts of other kinds of bodies. So the first part, therefore, is Kant and the deontological approach essentially dissolves and in its place becomes a very strong consequentialism based, in my view, upon the structure that is developed by the champion deontologist himself. Uh, the second thing that one has to deal with is the way in which our friend Kant starts to look at the various issues of individual obligations and two-party transactions, going back to what we talked about. As I mentioned to Stephen Lukes when we were talking about this in the break, is that Kant, in effect, was essentially morally obtuse, I think is the right word, relative to the Englishman uh, W.D. Ross, um, who developed the theory of intuitionism based upon prima facie obligation. And what I want to do, in effect, is to contrast the prima facie obligation of a man like Ross with the absolute obligations that are developed by a man like Kant. And Ross, in effect, is much more subtle. And indeed, although he did not know it, because again, in the grand Oxford tradition of which I was raised in part, uh, the philosophers, not only did they never speak to the economists, they never spoke to the lawyers either, right? And so it's very clear when you read Ross that he never once read any book, including Ralph Sutton, The Forms of Action at Common Law, The Personal Actions, written a year before he wrote The Right and the Good, which outlines many of this particular stuff. But the way in which all legal systems organize themselves is through a system of presumptions that start with a set of prima facie cases. I'm not going to give them all here, but again, this is a case in which the Roman clarity in Gaius is far superior to the English confusion that takes place when the theory of obligations gets tied up with the theory of procedure as it did in the forms of action. Technical stuff I won't talk about now. And so what happens is the prima facie case basically says the ordinary position between two individuals is, I don't owe you nothing, you don't owe me nothing. We are strangers. And then the question is, what is it that shifts the balance? And the answer is, within the libertarian framework, two things. One is that you hurt me, and by which I mean, in this case, the application of direct force or the creation of traps. I do not mean economic competition. And you didn't keep your promises to me. Now, these are supposed to create presumptions in which the corrective justice theory, which is socially efficient, I might add, says redress the industry by giving compensation, or with respect to the promise, either keep it on the one hand, pay damages, or be subject to specific performance on the other. So what happens is the moment you start to put it this way, you realize why it is that Ross is onto something good, but doesn't understand what he's onto. Because the moment you think about it, the prima facie case creates the wrong but it doesn't tell you what the appropriate remedy ought to be. And the literature on whether we use damages or injunctions or public or private stuff is enormous and absolutely necessary to carry out the program. Within the Kantian universe, it's kind of difficult to figure out what you're going to do on this stuff because one of the things about moral as opposed to legal discourse is the moralist just has to say something is wrong. The legalist has to tell you what the hell you're supposed to do about it. And the philosophers systematically underestimate the importance of that. This is not to deny the importance of their achievement in getting the right prima facie cases. It's just to say that it's not complete. 
Now, the second problem that comes up with this is, in fact, what do we mean by prima facie? It means at first view. Well, that means there's got to be a second view looking at this subject. And so you then have to figure out what are going to be what lawyers call the affirmative defenses that can be raised against the prima facie case. And it turns out that, you know, if I hit you, to give you a very simple version, I can say that you assume the risk, I can say that I did it in self-defense. There are a variety of things which, for the most part, people will want to let in. But it turns out which ones you let in and why you let them in or how you let them in is, in fact, a very difficult question because what you have to do is to have a normative theory which first explains what the prima facie case is going to look like and then be strong enough to generate the set of defenses that take place afterwards. And the way in which this is actually done technically is you think of the law as trying to get to this ultimate end of social optimality, but doing it by a system of approximations. For those of you, for example, who've gone through the math, what you will understand is every time you try to find out something about curves, what you do is you approximate it by straight lines. And you do that to find the area of a circle, to figure out how an integral works. Lots of things are working in that way. Lawyers do the same thing. This is our first approximation. We're better off saying that there's a prima facie wrong if you hit somebody than we are in saying, gee, hitting somebody is no different from walking down the street. So the direct application of force by one person to another becomes the paradigmatic wrong, both under the Roman Lex Aquilia, their tort statute, and under the English common law system. And then you start working out all the defenses. You can do exactly the same thing for promises and exactly the same thing for fraud. And the way in which it works, more or less, is as follows. With promises, it turns out you could then ask the question, why need I not keep my promise? And I remember one year in contract asking one of my Kantian scholars what Kant said about whether or not I have to perform my promise if you haven't performed yours, oh, Mr. Lingle, right? And he said, Kant never worried about that. I said, well, you know, Kant never worried about commerce, but there is a maximization theorem, minimized credit risk, which I talk about in the paper, which gets you a long way to a perfect solution, but never gets you there. Because the system of approximation essentially always breaks down before idealization. And the same thing is true with respect to fraud. And so the simple Kantian illustration of your absolute necessity to always tell the truth means, he says in a kind of sneaky way, you don't have to say anything, but if the guy comes in and wants to kill your kid, you have to talk. If you're really going to talk, you have to tell him the truth. And everybody says, Meshuga. Um, that's Yiddish, not Hindi. Uh, and it means nuts uh, in English. And, and the point is, of course, correct, because we are allowed to use force in self-defense. We're allowed to lie in self-defense or in the defense of third parties. So what happens with Kantian absolutism is it is a moral and intellectual disaster because it cuts out from the discourse all of the law relating to justifications and excuses. This stuff is so complicated within the casuist tradition that it literally takes years of study to get it all right, if you're going to get it right at all. Uh, but what happens is we're not worried about perfection. But what we can say is the moment you start talking about absolute necessity in some of these weird ways, it means you're missing the trees through the forest. And so this kind of Kantian dogmatism turns out to be wrong. And in fact, the greatest condemnation of Kant on this point is no one would believe that the universalization of saying never tell a lie in fact solves the problem of how you deal with aggressive behavior by other individuals. He flunks his own categorical imperative. Uh, so we essentially have a world of marginal improvements in the Marshallian sense. The law of presumptions is that with respect to individual two-party disputes. And all of the stuff that I talked about with respect to having social changes through Pareto improvements and government coercion is the same process worked for large number situations. So if you put the two together, and I will end on this note, it means, in effect, that if you can handle the two-party cases through presumption and the end-party cases through the same method, you have a comprehensive theory which will eventually turn into what some people like to call social justice. Thank you. I'm going to assert my liberty and stick to Richard's paper because... Uh, Yes, you did. I mean, uh, to be fair to you, most of it was your paper already. Um, 
I enter into Richard's paper from a, a disciplinary, affective, and political perspective, which is different from his, and consequently my no normative orientation is different from the one he adopts. And this is not because I privilege deontic categories as opposed to consequentialist ones. In fact, I regard the valuation of outcomes as critical to normative concerns. However, I do con consider that for normative theory or any theory of consequentialism that seeks legitimacy as moral, the range of consequences considered should A, be wider to include a wide range of social goods, basic rights, identities, cultural, religious, gender identities, and so on, and B, should necessarily not, should not necessarily eschew recourse to deontic moral norms to settle issues between competing consequences. But these are points to which I shall return a little later. Um, it is always a challenge when you enter a discursive field, so to speak, as an outsider. And yet, since issues of moralities, and there is uh, a deliberate use of the word plural here, are never settled once, either tempor temporarily or discursively, there is always an opportunity as well. As, a polit as political scientists, we are trained to go looking for the political and the constituted in law, policy, rules, economics, and even in the presumed objective spaces of science and technology. The central question of the paper is, how can market behavior be administered such that outcomes are moral? Neoclassical law and economics offers clear answer. Market behavior should be so designed that they maximize wealth, reduce costs, and maximize benefits rather than weigh indeterminate moral absolutes of justice, morality, or rights, judges, policymakers, arbiters only need to weigh outcomes in terms of Calder-Hicks efficiency operator optimality. In other words, to determine costs and benefits presumed or incurred, we must weigh the net costs and benefits to all parties and rule according to that which maximizes wealth. In cases where costs imposed on injured parties are less than benefits that accrue to p culpable parties, we should allow the harm to continue or perhaps mitigate the harm by compensating those harmed by those who gain. Richard more or less adopts this model. However, according to him, consequences generated are not uh, just economically optimal, but also morally so. Market morali morality ought to have, according to him, three features. They should be judged as outcomes or consequences, and not based on transcendental truths or Kantian deontic imperatives, which are dogmatic, unresponsive to real life conditions and conundrums and lead to counterintuitive results. B, they should be based on standards or measures that can be universalized as options. C, Pareto or caldo -Hicks standards can serve as universal criteria to measure moral outcomes. Very quickly, I want to tease out the implications that are generated by these three features and hopefully argue that I do not see them as sufficient conditions for moral outcomes. The first point that I raise relates to externalities. A standard utilitarian cost-benefit measure seeks to see if benefits outweigh costs before a policy rule is adopted. What is included is evaluation of all affected parties if the, gainers, if the gains to the gainers is greater than loss to the losers. Then the rule or the trade is efficient as there is an enhancement of net utility gained. Thus, while comparing pecuniary externalities with real, that is non-pecuniary externalities, uh, Epstein states that the only way to distinguish between two types of harm suffered is through the lens, and I'm quoting here, the only way to distinguish between two types of harm suffered is through the lens of overall social welfare rather than through the frame of two competing individuals where one loses and one wins and where overall it's a positive sum game. However, Richard replaces the, standard uh, the, the utilitarian standard of aggregate utilities with a Parisian efficiency in which there are no losers or with Calder-Hicks efficiency if there are losers. A case can be made that almost any distribution between uh, two trading parties can meet the test, test of Pareto optimality. Quite a few, even Pareto superiority, where the position of both parties improves. However, as Dworkin points out, even willing trades that improve the position of both parties may adversely affect some third party, for example, by changing prices. Let me uh, use an example to explain this point. In a deal between two pharma companies, Ranvaxi and Pfizer, uh, 
the introduction of cheaper generic version of Lipitor was delayed by six months. Thus, while the deal was Pareto efficient, in fact, even superior, resulting to a jump in share prices of both Pfizer and Ranbaxy, it created externalities of higher costs, loss of access, treatment, reduced quality of life for third parties. However, both from a policy law standpoint and from a moral standpoint, negative externalities which render people, even if they are outside the, put, the particular utility loop or the contractual frame, cannot be assumed away by any moral theory. If these externalities were to generate liabilities and be internalized through compensations, the cost of doing that may be suboptimal. How do we then deal with the external externalities that happen on this large social scale? Alternatively, if we were to expand the Pareto standard to include not just contracting parties, but the entire range of people likely to be affected, it seems unlikely that we would arrive at a Pareto optimal situation where no one has been rendered worse off. The implementation of the calder hicks standards presents its own set of difficulties, primarily triggered off by the requirement of payments to be made by net gainers to net losers. How do we measure social costs of loss of livelihood, lives, health costs, for instance? What kinds of value can be accorded to emotional health and aesthetic experience, say, of clean, green environment? Can we buy off social losses of certain kinds? How much is considered enough? The point that I'm trying to make is often there is a false sense of security about what is a cost of what. These, I think, are important questions for moral claims. Poorer the society, the more difficult and contentious is the task of arriving at either efficient Pareto optimal or even calder hicks solutions. Compensation for loss of land may be transacted, compensation for loss of land that is transacted voluntarily between a large corporation and community of farmers at suboptimal prices. The socioeconomic location of the victim may be such that any compensation may be both Pareto efficient and Calder Hicks compliant. Is the placement of liability itself, therefore, any measure of the fairness of outcome? One of the responses of liberal law has been not just internalizing externalities, but also broadening it, inspired by COES, to include psychic costs. However, the very uh, act of monetizing aesthetic, psychological, or even physiological costs and entitlements remains far from a value-free uh, apolitical criteria. Any set of prices one uses involves a political judgment about what is valued and how it is valued. Further, an unintended but expected consequence of monitoring externalities and transaction costs would be in the form of an overweening state apparatus uh, setting the terms and conditions of bargaining. The second point that I raise is with respect to value preferences. Epstein's central concern is to establish the grounds on which mo market mo uh, the morality of markets can be established, but established in such a way that they have universal balance. In fact, universality for him is almost a conditional criteria of morality, and for this reason, even though he finds numerous problems with deont deontological categorical imperatives of Kant, he wants to retain the universal appeal and applicability of moral standards. For him, how else can we establish morality of standards unless they are generalized and universalized? So while he rejects the moral absoluteness of Kantian transcendental categories and replaces them with consequential measure of morality, he continues to uphold the objectivity and the trans-historicity of standards that he recommends. There are two underlying assumptions here that can be critiqued. There is a commitment to a vision of morality through a standard of Pareto optimal or Calder Higgs, which displays an adherence to both a non-comparative idea of welfare and of undoing of harm. Second, relatedly, there is an assumption that memberships to particular political and cultural communities is arbitrary and too indeterminate a category to be factored in the valuation of moral outcomes. Uh, the welfare or the harm uh, that welfare or harm is non-comparative means that it is possible to determine globally what constitutes harm in various social, cultural, environmental settings and what valid claims of co compensation or distribution of harm people may have without reference to particular schemes of cooperation, particular onto epistemic worlds or to political choices. These are variables that can be regarded as arbitrary or externalities 
does not seem to suggest that these attachments play no role in, uh, no relevant role in normative uh, analysis of any kind of redistribution of goods. The liberal do no harm principle through the use of calder hicks standard of compensation can be used to correct the depiction of universal normative uh, vision as being inattentive to pluralism. Uh, these assumptions can be problematic for a number of reasons, typically manifesting themselves in encounters that relate to negotiations between commoditized, monetized societies and communities that are outside of its fray. In recent times in India, land acquisition cases <coughs> excuse me, have for a variety of reasons faced local resistance. In some cases, it is because the compensation offered is not good, but in some cases, as it recently happened in Orissa, uh, an East Indian state, that the local community refused to part with land over which they had no formal titles, despite huge, huge reserves of bauxite that underlay the, f the forest that they occupied, and despite the seemingly attractive compensations that they were offered. They had a strong sense of entitlement over these forests and the mountain they considered to be the abode of the deity. What they did not share was the terms of the market and the language of wealth generation, commodification, and economic development. This is a language that is alien to them and outside of the moral universe they inhabit. The Supreme Court eventually in its ruling gave primacy to the community sentiments and agency, making categories like religion and culture normatively relevant for a proposed market-led transaction. The rationalist postulate of utilitarian consequentialism goes for a toss when trades are likely to take, when trades are to take place between diverse moral and cultural universes. The tribal community did not rationalize in terms of standard welfare expectations of the poor opting for housing, hospitals, jobs as compensation. Briefly put, the normative relevance of a particular cultural, social, political membership is consequential to any considerations of moral outcomes from a justificatory perspective and from a standardizing one. Once we attach normative weights to uh, political and cultural utilities, the moral consistency of net welfare or overall, welf overall welfare comes under strain. The util utilitarian calculations are unhelpful in adjudicating between competing claims as it has no standard of comparing disparate utilities. This remains a problem for utilitarian morality and Epstein doesn't want to disable his thesis. So he argues that it is dangerous to allow negative veto preferences to work themselves into social equation for they can disable the most optimal social outcomes. Do we assign, so the question that I have for him is, do we assign to cultural preferences and harm the same status as certain peculiar kinds of individual harms which should be assumed away as externalities. If we do so, then we allow certain preferences to get reflected in the frame of legal and economic considerations, while others are relegated outside of it for concerns of optimality. It would be fair to say then that rulemaking and rule adjudication which regulate allocation and distribution of welfare and wealth are seldom value-free apolitical ventures for they pur as they purport to be. As Duncan Kennedy says, it is not true that the correct answer to how to value is implicit in the very conception of efficiency. So long as we define efficiency in terms of net excess of social benefits over social costs, or even in terms of optimal outcomes, uh, it does not seem that ambiguities and value preferences are, uh, that are built into the it seems that the ambiguities and value preferences are built into the concept rather than resolved by it. And finally, a last point on the limits of consequentialism. If one accepts that consequentialism resolves moral questions, which I think they do, it is important that a distinction is made between the best procedure for making moral dis decisions um, about what to do and about the criteria for moral rightness and wrongness. This distinction compels us to evaluate consequences according to some agreed upon criteria of moral rightness. Let me use a, uh, an example that Will Kimlicka use, uses. Shooting people in an area of London to stop, parking in an illegal, to stop illegal parking in an area. This would increase the happiness of thousands of Londoners. And this is not a point that uh, Richard is making. However, I want to use it so as to go on to make the point. Um, this would increase the happiness that thousands of Londoners would derive from the end of the menace. 
In such a case, he argues, we do not even need to calculate whether threatening to shoot people over parking offenses would maximize good outcomes. We already know that threatening to shoot people over parking offenses is wrong. And any system that it requires us to make calculation, that requires us to make that calculation, is a system we should reject because by forget, uh, is a system we should reject because it misunderstands and misrepresents moral reasoning. Because measures of utilities often compete and often compel us to compare, accord priority, adjudicate, I would be inclined to retain a core of deontic norms, especially those that protect life. Because utilitarianism does not prioritize consequences, despite its many attractions, by itself it remains unhelpful in distinguishing between fair and unfair outcomes. In his analysis, um, yeah, uh, in short, given utilitarian uh, conse consequentialism's intuitive appeal that consequences matter, it is worth asking two questions. One, whether it is the only thing that can inform our decisions about good and bad outcomes, good or bad behavior. Should we not, uh, and two, should non-economic utilities matter for questions of consequential morality? Thank you. Uh, First, the good news about the talk is that you know the choice between competition and monopoly, which was the focus of the paper, was not subject, I thought, to any kind of criticism. So that already puts her 80% in my camp. Uh, the other question is how we deal with the three cases which I didn't raise and whether or not they could work within the theory. And all of them fit within the theory if you understand how the theory works. I mean, the first one is the patent illustration. Uh, what she gave was a six-month extension. This is basically the American, and some other places perhaps, view that uh, if you challenge a patent, uh, you can then be a co-exclusive owner, and the issue is whether or not you can collude in order to maximize utility uh, of yourself causing other people harm. Uh, the problem with the analysis is you can't begin it simply looking at the time that the six months of extension takes place. You have to go back to the ex ante perspective and figure out how the entire system is going to work. And if you really say that every time you charge a positive price for something and some people are going to die because they're going to be excluded from it, this is an argument for having no patents at all because the same thing could be had in any and all cases with respect to the first units that's produced. And you then have to worry about whether or not you want to have public subsidies for research, which is the world's greatest disaster in the history of Western civilization. The correct answer in this case is not to worry about the small fry issues there. Uh, it's not important. The key issue is to make sure that the uh, system that evaluates these drugs for clinical excellence is not a disaster, and it's the FDA part of this thing, at least in the American context, which is completely wrong. In fact, by giving the co-exclusive period, I'm in favor of allowing them to monopolize because what it does is it encourages the introduction of new drugs, which in fact are much better competitors. Generic stuff, if you actually go and look at the market, they don't last very long. Uh, the system tends to decay for a variety of technical reasons. But just take my word for it, this is an area I work in as a full-time expertise. Uh, the analysis is more complicated and it fits perfectly well here. Uh, the second case that she talked about was all the land cases. And here it's important to understand the distinction in dealing with things. When I said, in effect, you do not take into account offenses and envy, what I meant are those of strangers. I did not say that the consequential losses to an individual when their property rights are invaded, whether it be by tort on the one hand or by condemnation on the other hand, ought to be ignored. So in the tort law, everybody understands that if you hit somebody, there is compensation not only for economic losses, but for pain and suffering and so forth. Uh, that is exactly what happens when you start dealing with the condemnation. And so if you, I, mean, I don't know if you've read my books on this stuff, but I take a position which is very similar to yours on the framework that I'm using. Uh, first of all is that you want to be narrow with respect to the definitions of public use because you know in effect that the condemnation system is going to run roughshod over subjective preferences of ordinary individuals with respect to the property that they lose, so you want to cut back on it. Strong libertarians in many cases are just against the application of an eminent domain principle at all. Uh, but everybody in the classical liberal tradition is narrow with respect. And the second point that you mentioned is in fact correct. 
uh, which is that when you deal with figuring out how you compensate, you cannot ignore the soft externalities of communities that are disrupted. The American case of Pole Town, which was ripped down to put up a GM plant, is essentially the American version of this kind of folly carried to an extreme in which the economic claims were overblown and the social losses were understated. Um, it's a disgrace that it happened. So the theory, in fact, goes exactly the opposite way once there's an invasion of property rights in terms of dealing with these things. A third point, of course, she mentions are these sort of group and collective externalities of one sort or another. And essentially, uh, these fit in with the system. As I mentioned earlier, you start as a lawyer thinking about exchanges, spot transactions, but sooner or later you have to start dealing with associations. And the key feature here is to understand that the internal dynamics of these associations are such that you never want to allow the state to force membership into them by strangers for the way in which it can disrupt their internal operation. And this is a protection of every kind of identity that you want to have can be within this. So if you want to talk, for example, about gender identity or whatever it is, and you form an organization with that as its objective, the state cannot be in a position to force outsiders into this. So the American version of this that I will just mention and then stop is a case involving the Christian legal organization. And what the law school at Hastings says is the Christians have to admit all gay members, whether they like it or not, who can then vote them out of their own organization. And one of the enduring disgraces of the United States Supreme Court is they said that's an appropriate way for a public government to run one of its monopolies. Uh, completely inexcusable. So uh, the protection of minority groups, soft sentiments by strong property rights and voluntary association is a part of this. And so this then gets back to the final question. If you understand subjectivity correctly, there is no set of values that fall outside the system that aren't taken into account. By the time you get the voluntary exchange rules right, by the time you get the association rules right, by the time you get the compensation rules right with respect to both torts and with respect to condemnation, everything that she wants to protect is part of the equation. Now that doesn't answer all questions. As I mentioned in the paper, you get to hard cases for which there can be honest disagreements. And so if you say, oh, you cannot disrupt the community because of the valuable metal laws under it, you know, I'm pretty sympathetic to the claim that she puts it. But if it turns out that those laws are absolutely indispensable for developing some medicines which will allow people to stay alive, now you're facing the same problem everybody else is. You've got this wonderful belief in the importance of health and this wonderful belief in ethnic communities, and the two of them essentially collide. What do you do? The usual answer is you go slow on condemnation, and if you condemn, what you do is you always pay excesses above market value. And that was the position that I took in my takings book.